Well, good morning. Get your Bibles and open to Psalm 38. <clears throat> Psalm 38. We've now begun our, our summer series that we've done for the last few uh, years, uh, a summer of Psalms. And so um, there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason to uh, why these different Psalms are preached. Uh, each pastor kind of, it's come, kind of first come, first serve. You pick the one you want to preach on that Sunday, and that's the one that we preach on. And so um, we do keep track of the ones that we've preached already, so we're not repeating, but uh, we find ourselves today in Psalm 38. Psalm 38. As we often say when we come to this time to read this scripture, that this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The reason that we see our nation in turmoil, the reason we see injustice or sin out there is because our world has rejected this word, this word. This word is the only hope for you, saint. It's the only hope for you, sinner. It's the only hope for anyone, anywhere, at any time. In the history of this earth, nothing has changed. God is God, and this is His Word. And so I encourage you today, as we read His Word, that we submit to it and believe it. Starting with verse 1 of Psalm 38. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My, wo my wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day long I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man, I do not hear. Like a mute man who does not open his mouth, I have become like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait." It is you, O Lord my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them rejoice over me. Only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity, I am sorry for my sin. But my foes are vigorous, they are mighty. And many are those who hate me wrongfully, those who render me evil for good. Accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Let's pray. Father, we have just sang, have mercy on me. Lord, we confess our sin before you. We know that, that we are often not the people that you call us to be. And that is sin, Lord. And so we confess that. We ask as we repent before you that you would turn our hearts toward you. Lord, use your word today and your servant David as he confesses his own sin and admits his own iniquity. Lord, that we would be like David, a broken and contrite heart before you. You will not turn us away. Lord, help us to be a holy people before you and open our eyes to the reality of this message. Use your Holy Spirit today, Lord God, 
to illuminate this passage to us. Shine your light upon it so we may see who you are and what you require. Help us, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're like me, you have probably looked at the TV a few times over the last few weeks. You can't get away from it, the TV or maybe the radio. And we look around us and we see sin. We see sin in the world, in individuals, in groups, in mobs, in violence. We see sin in the world. And that sin seems to be out there, out there somewhere in other communities, other places. It's, it's there. But the question I have for us today is not so much about the sin out there, but what about the sin in here? What about the sin in my own heart? It's easier for us to, it's easier for me to sometimes watch the television or see these newscasts and, 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 and cluck my tongue and roll my eyes and shake my head and think, oh my goodness, isn't that horrible? Aren't they? Aren't they? Aren't they? But then stop and realize, wait a minute, what about me? What about my heart? What about my life? Psalm 38 lies toward the end of what has been called Book 1 of the Psalms, which contains Psalm 1 through 41. It's one of the penitential psalms. These are psalms which convey deep contrition and repentance for sin, coupled with God's grace and forgiveness, which restores the sinner. This psalm, Psalm 38, is an individual lament. David, the psalmist, finds himself plagued with physical illness. The result is an intense time of personal anguish and hence his lament. He complains against God's discipline, who uses his enemies as the rod of his divine correction. But David, the psalmist here, trusts in God, petitioning him to remove his sickness and suffering. He believes that in due time, deliverance will come from God. Stanley Jackie, in his commentary on this psalm, says this, as is the case of uh, with some of other, other potential, penitential psalms, this one too is long on details of physical pain and sickness, the presumed effects of sin, but very short on details of the sin itself. In fact, the psalm leaves the nature of sin com- committed utterly unspecified. And it's true, when we read this psalm, we see that there's sin there, but we don't know what the sin is. And it's really helpful for us because we might look at this sin and say, well, that's not my sin. That's David's problem. It's not my problem. But God in His, His wisdom and through the Holy Spirit has, has not revealed what David's sin is. It's just sin. And that's good for us. Because guess what? David was a sinner. And so are you. And so are you. Stanley Jackie goes on and says this, This psalm should be a medicine against taking our sins lightly. Once we feel tortured on account of our sin, as the author of this psalm did, we may safely believe that we are on the road to genuine spiritual recovery. We need to reflect on our own sin and be tortured by it, be disturbed by it, be angered by our own sin so that we may actually go for help. Many of you uh, have had illnesses. I remember a few years ago, maybe a couple of years ago, I was preaching from this very pulpit and had some strange thing going on in my stomach a really bad pain. And by the time I finished my sermon, I walked straight out and I told Penny Ross, goodbye, I'm going to urgent care right now. I'm driving straight to urgent care because something is wrong with me. And I got there and I was, I, was, I was relieved because once I got there, they could do an x-ray and do some things and find out this is what's going on. And you had relief because you knew what was wrong. They saw the symptoms, they diagnosed it, and they gave a prescription. And so this morning, as we look at David's sin and our own That is my prayer for you, brothers and sisters. It's my prayer for myself that when we see the sin there, that we will go for aid, that we will get true help, and we know where that help only comes from. With gut-wrenching clarity, David describes the consequences of his sin and the only hope out of it. We would do well to pause and look long and hard at this psalm for what ails David ails us as well, and that is sin. So we see four elements here in this passage. David's cry, David's confession, David's condition, David's consolation. So let's get started. Number one, David's cry. 
The psalmist begins with a cry to God. Look at verse 1 and 2. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your, anger, for your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. David begins his lament with a cry for mercy to his God. Throughout this psalm, David is completely realistic and transparent. He knows that he, through his own actions, have brought these things upon himself. But what he cries for here is that his loving father will be merciful in his discipline. Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, Baptist pastor from London of years past, wrote on this passage, and he, he kind of puts himself in David's shoes and speaks as if David is speaking. And here's what Charles Spurgeon says. Rebuked I must be, for I am an erring child, and thou a careful father. But throw, too, but throw not too much anger into the tones of thy voice. Deal gently, although I have sinned grievously. The anger of others I can bear, but not thine. As thy love is most sweet to my heart, so thy displeasure is most cutting to my conscience. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Chasten me if thou wilt. It is, the, it is a father's prerogative, and to endure it obediently is a child's duty. But, oh, turn not the rod into a sword. Smite not so as to kill. True, my sins might well inflame thee, but let thy mercy and long suffering quench the glowing coals of thy wrath. O oh, let me not be treated as an enemy or dealt with as a rebel. Bring to remembrance thy covenant, thy fatherhood, and my feebleness, and spare this servant. I remember growing up in my own uh, household as a young man in, in Texas and my, with my mother and father being godly Christian parents, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but often doing things that kids shouldn't do, right? And, and, and discipline would come. And in my household, we believe the scriptures, which says, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? And so, no, we believe what the scriptures teach. And I, hopefully that's what we teach here and believe here that, that an undisciplined son is an unloved son. And punishment come, must come, corporal punishment, spanking. But I tell you, there were times where I had done wrong. And the worst punishment that I got from my father was not the spanking. I could bear that more than his look of disappointment. And what was worse than that was the tears of my mother. The tears of my mother, of just the shaking of her head, or just a, oh, Kevin. <laughs> that was, what, give me a spanking, right? But, but, but by my love for you and, 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 the, and the, the disappointment in your voice and the sadness when you see that your son has let you down is too much to bear sometimes. And David here is in, the, is in that situation. He pleads with his loving father. He knows the responsibility of his actions are his own, and he cries out to God for mercy, for mercy. The Old Testament and the New Testament speak about God's discipline for those he loves. In Deuteronomy 8, 5, God says there, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Hebrews 2, 5 through 11 speaks of this same love for God and the discipline of his sons. He says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not lightly regard the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have all had earthly fathers who disciplined us as, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So yes, God disciplines. And even as David cries out under the discipline of the Lord, he remembers that God hears him. This is important for us to remember. Look at verse 9 in our Psalm 38. David says, O Lord, all my longing is before you. 
My sighing is not hidden from you. And this is important for us to remember that God himself hears us. God sees us. God, God, God condescends toward us. John Piper, reflecting on the Psalms, says this, This is why we cleave to the Psalms. They are us. Pain, loneliness, affliction, trouble, guilt, burdens, uh, illness, cast down, turmoil, shame, moaning, weeping, nights flooded with tears. David knows that God sees it all and hears it all. When our hearts break, brothers, sisters, friend, when God's heavy is heavy, when God's hand is heavy on us, He is there. Pour out your soul to your Father. He hears you. And that's exactly what David does, doesn't he? When he brings his confession. Point two, David's confession. Look at verses three and four. We come to David's confession. He says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. David rightly sees that God is sovereignly in control and part of this discipline. This is coming from God, his sovereign uh, father. But also David sees his own responsibility. He says, there is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. The Greek term uh, harmatia, meaning sin, uh, which conveys the idea of falling short of the mark. We know the scripture, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I've often uh, likened that to going to El Dorado Park where my son and I take our bows and arrows, right? And we go and there's a, a long way off. It's actually, it was built, that uh, archery area was built for the Olympics, for the 84 Olympics. That's where they had the, the, the archery for the Olympics there. And, and so you got these long field and like a football field and way out there, there's this arrow and you think of uh, pulling back that mighty bow and letting the arrow go and it just goes blink and doesn't even make it to the target. That's our sin, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not that we just miss the bullseye by a little bit. You don't even hit the target, okay? You're impotent. You're powerless to, 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 to glorify God as we ought. We are made for the glory of God, but sin causes us to fall short of the mark. Another aspect of sin is called transgression. It has the very basic idea of crossing the line. It's crossing a boundary. It's going somewhere where we, where we shouldn't go. The old VBS song or little, little uh, uh, Sunday school song we used to sing when I was a kid was, was this. Uh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little feet, where you go. For your father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Then it had, be careful, little hand. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, be, be careful, little hands, where you go. Or, or be careful, little hands, what you touch. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Why? Because we have a father above who's looking down in love. So be careful. Be careful. And that's the idea of transgression. There are things where our feet should not take us. There are places we should not go. There are things we should not touch. And there are things we should not see. Those are transgressions. That's crossing boundaries that God has set for us. Another aspect of sin is is this idea that's here in Psalm 38. It's also in Psalm 51 the idea of iniquity, iniquity. And the, the idea of iniquity is twistedness, twistedness or perverseness. Uh, the Latin word in, uh, the prefix in means not, and equity there means like equity. So not just, that's the idea of injustice, something that is righteous and good and just, and it's twisted. It's no longer justice. It's no longer righteousness. It is wickedness. It is twisted. David says in verse 18, as he confesses, he says, I confess my iniquity. I confess my perverseness. I confess my twistedness. And then he adds this, I am sorry for my sin. This is important to remember because sinners can confess their iniquity. People can say, yeah, that's a sin. Yeah, I confess it. I fess up. That was wrong. I shouldn't have done, you know, whatever. But but, but David adds, I'm sorry for my sin. It's one thing to say, yep, I did it. It's another to say, yes, I did it, and I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have thought it. I'm sorry. I'm grieved in my heart. Please forgive me. Brothers, let me talk to you. Men, when you speak out in anger and you're frustrated with your wife, do you quickly say, 
but if you hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have said that, right? If you didn't, the reason I got angry is because I tripped over the shoe you left there. If you would pick up your shoes, if you would clean off the counter, if you would do this or do that, then I wouldn't, right? We confess our anger, but then we blame someone else. We don't take responsibility. David here takes responsibility for his own actions. I confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. David confesses. He calls the sin what it is, iniquity. He doesn't make excuses. He comes clean. He fesses up. He admits his twisted ways. Friend, isn't it time for you to come clean? Isn't it time for you to come clean? To confess, to stop blaming others, to take responsibility for your own sin. Because you see, sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. That brings us to our third point, David's condition. Sin truly has consequences. And David, throughout this psalm, just kind of lists these consequences over and over again, adding on and helping us see clearly that sin is sick. Verse 3, David says, there is no soundness in my flesh. There is no health in my bones. David is sick with sin. Verse 4, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. He's, he's drowning in his sin. It reminds me of, of a time when I was sharing the gospel with a friend of mine when I worked at a school in Watts, and she was lamenting over the state of her life. And the, this relationship she was involved with, with was, was not a good relationship. It was a sinful one. And she was a professed believer, but she had walked away and strayed from the Lord long ago. And as she recounted how horrible her life was, I, 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 said, I said, it's like you're, you're in the ocean, you're in the deepest ocean, and you're holding a big bag of concrete. And, 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 and you're trying to swim, for the, but you're going deeper and deeper and deeper. It's dragging you down. It's dragging you down. Let go of the concrete. Let go of the bag and, and swim for the surface. And I remember she said, I can't. I can't. She loved this more than she loved breathing clean, fresh air. The sin for a season was better than honoring and serving her Savior. David goes on, verse 5, he says, My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. Listen, sin stinks. Sin stinks and foolishness festers. Foolishness festers. We're not talking about foolishness like a, a three-year-old spilling some milk and being silly. Oh, you're being so silly. You're being so foolish, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about wickedness. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. True foolishness is a rejection of God and rejection of godliness. Sin stinks. Foolishness festers. In the 70s, the southern rock band Leonard Skinner wrote a song written by Ronnie Van Zant. It was during a time when they were doing lots of uh, uh, illicit drugs and drinking, alcohol abuse. And one of the members of their band, uh, in, in, a, in a drunken driving accident, ran his car into an oak tree and they had to stall their uh, concert tour for a few weeks. And Van Zant wrote this song. Whiskey bottles and brand new cars. Oak tree, you're in my way. There's too much coke and too much smoke. Look what's going on inside you. Ooh, that smell. Can't you smell that smell? Ooh, that smell. The smell of death is around you. Stuck a needle in your arm, so take another toke. Have a blow for your nose. One more drink, fool, will drown you. Ooh, that smell. Can't you smell that smell? Ooh, that smell. The smell of death's around you. Now they call you Prince Charming. Can't speak a word when you're full of lewds. Say you're all right, come tomorrow. But tomorrow might not be here for you. Ooh, that smell. Can't you smell that smell? Ooh, that smell. The smell of deaths around you. One little problem that confronts you got a monkey on your back. Just one more fix, Lord, might do the trick. One hell of a price for you to get your kicks. Ooh, that smell. Can't you smell that smell? Ooh, that smell. The smell of deaths around you. Sin stinks. Sin stinks. And the problem is sometimes when it's your own smell, 
you get used to it. You get used to it. Uh, many of you know I was a middle school teacher for the last four years. Ooh, that smell. What happens when a young elementary school boy grows into manhood? He begins to smell. Franklin Middle School, go out to recess, lunch, basketball for 30 minutes, soccer on the soccer field, come back in to Mr. Bryan's class. And there was a number of times where I pulled boys aside and said, let's step outside just for a minute and try to kindly but firmly say, brother, <laughs> you smell. <laughs> There's a thing, it comes in little cans. It's, it's an ingenious invention. I don't know if you've seen it before. <laughs> called deodorant. <laughs> Use this liberally to your body parts, right? That smell. But the challenging thing is that sometimes they wouldn't smell it. And so a loving, a loving father, a loving teacher would pull aside a young man and say, let me talk to you because I love you. I care for you. I want the best for you. And that's what we need in the Christian church because sin stinks. And sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't recognize it. Sometimes we don't smell it, but others do. And the loving thing to do is to pull someone aside and to say, brother, I, I smell you. <laughs> Let's repent. Let's walk together in righteousness. Let's, let's, let's have a fragrant aroma. Isn't it interesting how God uh, calls this time that we're having, it's, it's like a fragrant aroma. Our praise is this smell that comes up to God, and we want to be a fragrant aroma in His nostrils. When God smells, He says, I like that smell. That's, a, that's like fresh baked bread, right? It smells good. You smell good to me. I've said before, what smells better than a baby's? Where's that baby? What smells better than a baby's head, right? God's like, mmm, you smell like that to me. We don't want to smell each other's sin. We don't, we don't want God to smell our sin as well. Sin stinks, and the problem is sometimes we get used to our own smell. We don't see our own sin. Sometimes we need others to point it out to us. I was sitting in the, in the break room at a school I used to teach at years ago, and the big hot movie at that time that everyone was talking about was Bridges of Madison County, a popular movie with Clint Eastwood and, uh, I don't know, some other actors. And anyway, they were, they were all talking about it. Oh, my goodness. Then the, I was sitting at a, at a round table, and everyone's eating their lunch together, and they're going on and on about, oh, this is the most romantic movie ever. Oh, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's amazing. Wow, wow, wow. And then finally someone turns to me and says, Mr. Brian, have you, have you seen it? Have you seen it? And I responded, um, no, but... Do you know anything about it? I said, isn't, isn't it about adultery? And the table just went silent. Boom. And the young lady who asked me, the teacher asked me, she goes, I, I never, I never even thought about that. And then she just, in a, in a moment of transparency, she said, what does that say about me? And I responded a little younger and maybe a little more brash than I am now. Not that I'm not very brash now, but, but I, I, I responded, Look, when you live in a cave, you don't realize you're blind. And she actually received it. And the whole time we went, wow. And, they just, and we had a good discussion about that. In, in, immersed in this dark culture, she's just enjoying a movie about adultery and doesn't see the sin that is there. David goes on. David goes on. He continues to talk about the consequences of his sin. Look at verses 6, 7, 8, 10. He says, I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. I'm utterly bowed down. My sin is so heavy, I, I can't lift my shoulders. I can't lift my head. My head is hanging down. I, all day long I go about mourning. I, I'm, I'm groaning. I'm mourning. I'm, I'm saddened. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. Twice he talks about that. There's no health in me. There's no soundness in my flesh. It reminds me of a man I knew who was dealing with unconfessed sin in his, in his life and in his heart. And he was choosing not to repent, and he was brashly continuing his sin. And my brother and I discussed this gentleman, and, and, and we were watching him get sicker and sicker, literally health being robbed from him. And I said to my brother, I don't think he's going to be here next Christmas. I think he will die. And sure enough, we found out later that he had gone into the hospital and almost passed away, but he repented. He confessed his sin. He turned back to God. And next Christmas we saw him and he was vibrant and full of health all over again. This is David with his unconfessed sin. 
His sides are burning. There's no soundness in his flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. My heart throbs. My strength fails me in the light of my eyes. It has also gone out from me. There's no brightness in his life. Verse 13, I'm like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like a mute man who does, goes about, uh, who does not open his mouth, I become like a man who does not hear, in whose mouth there are, uh, there are no rebukes. He doesn't even have the energy to, to, to say, stop that. He can't rebuke others when they're making fun of him or, or tearing him down. Verse 17 says, for I am ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. I can't escape it. I can't escape my sin. Brothers and sisters, sin is unbearable. Sin crushes, sin festers, sin is ravenous, it consumes, sin is dumb, it is blind, sin stinks, it is stupid, sin kills, sin maims. If sin is so horrible as this, then what should our attitude be toward it? What should your attitude be toward sin? We should do what Christ says in Matthew 18. When confronting sin, he says this, and if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off. And throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Cut it out. Throw it away. Be done with it. Take violent, aggressive, decisive action against your sin. Let me say it again. Take violent aggressive, decisive action against your sin. This is what it demands. John Owen in his book, Mortification of Sin, says this, always be killing sin or it will be killing you. Always be killing sin or it will be killing you. We must take decisive action. And really, there's only one person who can help us with this. Jesus Christ, our God, Eustace, in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, C.S. Lewis' wonderful book in the Chronicles of Narnia, is tempted. He, Eustace Scrub is, is a, let me just say it this way, uh, the Greek word for that is punk. <laughs> Eustace is a punk, okay? And when you read the Chronicles of Narnia and you meet him in, in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he's a snobbish, um, he's just a punk. He's just, you just, he, you, you kinda, a kid you kind of love to hate. And Eustace sees this treasure where they're on this, uh, on this adventure, and he is enticed by it. And he steals a bracelet from this treasure, and he finds out later it's a cursed treasure. He steals this bracelet, and he puts it on, and the bracelet turns him into a dragon. And they're all looking for Eustace, and they can't find him. They find this dragon, finally, that's got this bracelet stuck on his arm, and he can't get it off because he's a big, giant dragon now. And here's this dragon who's moaning and crying, and at some point they realize... This is Eustace. This is my nephew or my cousin. This is the kid, Eustace. And he needs help. And the help comes in the form of Aslan, the, the, the lion, who is a, a figure of Christ. And Aslan comes and says, I can help you, but it's going to hurt. I can help you. I can turn you back into a boy, but it's going to hurt. And Eustace pretty much says, yeah, please help me. And Aslan pops out his claws. Here's this lion. He, 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 he releases his claws and begins to tear away at the flesh of the dragon and tear and tear and tear until finally the boy is revealed. And this is what useless, useless, <laughs> Eustace says, who was useless before, but now is useful. <laughs> Eustace says this, the very first tear Aslan made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. We should be like Eustace when it comes to our sin. God, rip it out. Cut it out. Get rid of it. Do surgery on my heart, oh God. Cut this out of me. Cut it out of me. Tear it out. Get, get, get rid of it. I know it's going to hurt, but the pleasure of having it gone is going to be so much better. We're not, going to, we're not going to continue with sin for a season like Joseph. No, no, the, the pleasure of serving our, our, our Lord and Savior is so much better than the pleasure of sin. 
Well, David then turns and looks, and he wonders if there's anyone who can help him. And so he looks first to those who are closest to him, his friends, companions, and his relatives. Verse 11 and 12, he says, My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague. They're standing far back. They're practicing social distance, right, from his sin. And my nearest kin stands far off. Even his closest relative won't help him. Then there's others who it's even worse. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. So they don't even help, but they they actually hurt. They add to his pain. But how can they really help? And who can really help ultimately? I mean, when it comes to my sin, can my wife really help me? She can point out my sin to me. She can maybe encourage me. Brothers and sisters, we, we, we can do that for each other, but can we ultimately help others in their sin? Because you see, my wife can't die for my sin. She might die on account of my sin, right? If I drink and I'm drunk and we do something, someone might die on account of my but they can't die for my sin. There's only one who can truly help, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that brings us to David's consolation, David's consolation. Number four, David's consolation. David says, Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Don't run away from me. These others are far from me. My relatives, my friends, my companions are far from me. Lord, don't be like them. Be near me. Verse 22, Lord, haste to help me. O Lord, my salvation. David's consolation, the only consoling he'll have is from a friend who is like Jesus, a friend is, who, who is Jesus himself. There is only one friend who is closer than a brother. Only one friend who would lay down his life for you. Only one friend who would not only die for a sinner, but die for sin itself. David's God, our God, Jesus Christ. And we end where we began as Kenny read this passage, which I didn't know he was going to read. 2 Corinthians 5.21, here's what we Wrap it up right here. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we know that we are sinners. We continue to fall short of your glory. We continue to err in our ways. We continue to to speak gossip and lies. We continue to have lustful thoughts and adulterous actions. We we, we tend to be lazy and slothful and steal from our employers. We don't put you first. We put ourselves first. We manufacture idols to worship that will bring no true satisfaction. Lord, we confess these sins to you. Lord, help us, help us to cut it out. Help us to, like Jesus said, take violent, decisive, immediate action when we see sin in our hearts. We want to honor you. We want to please you. We want to smell good to you and to our brothers and sisters. We want to have the aroma of Christ. Lord, help us. Help us, help us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.